A little earlier today, through two sessions, we were talking about international foods, international brands coming into India. One of the things that we've talked about often in the past, and we're going to continue this time too at India Food Forum, is the alliance avenues that are available between foreign partners and the Indian market. So we've got a great panel that I'd like to call up. Her Excellency Melba Priya, Ambassador of Mexico to India. Demi Nersa, Consul General, Consul General of the Republic of Poland. Ali Olga Kaya, Consul General of Turkey. Nitin Varma, Councillor Agricultural and Technical Specialist of the High Commission of Canada. Marika Yakas, Councillor Head of Trade and Economic Affairs, Delegation of the European Union to India. Francois Moreau Lalam, Agriculture Councillor, Embassy of France. Jurgen Mayer Chad, Trade and Investment Commissioner. The Consul General of, of Belgium, Margot Pavoncello, Trade Officer Agribusiness, the Department of Trade Commission at the Embassy of France, and Guy Bromley, Head of Trade and Investment, Northern India, and First Secretary of Trade and Investment, the British High Commission. And to moderate this session, I'd like to call back on stage Amit Lahani, convener of the Forum of Indian Food Importers and Managing Director of Max Foods. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's always an honor for the fact that we've been able to gather uh, the, the most illustrious panel that you can get on an India Food Forum, where representatives of countries from all across the world are sitting over here, and they're going to talk about the alliances and the avenues that they are going to open up for the Indian market the kind of efforts that they have put in the Indian market, their success stories in India, and what does the future hold for them in the Indian market. The fact that everyone wants to enter the Indian market and there are challenges which are there. Besides that, we've always seen that companies and countries and trade bodies make a big effort to get their product right to the right audience in the Indian market, which is not an easy task. We have a set of challenges, but obviously we have to be very consistent with our efforts. India has always been a long-term story. You have to have a five-year or a 10-year strategy when you come to India. You cannot think of India as a trading partner. And this is what we tell our exporters. This is what we tell our companies. This is what we tell our embassies and diplomatic missions. So despite all the perils of all the government tariff and non-tariff barriers, there is a growth story. There is an aspiration, and people want to expand their uh, you know, kind of, they want to expand their portfolio in the Indian market. So, you know, why is the world looking at us? So this uh, trend of what you see, that we have been growing on a very steady pace from 6% to about 8% right now, and all the other countries, except for, uh, you know, the world average, are declining. U.S. has been stable. China has been on a decline in terms of their GDP growth. So what are the opportunities that we see in terms of the Indian market? The double-digit growth, the fact that India is growing at such a fast, phenomenal rate, that it is very important. The, the 350 million middle-class population, fantastic opportunity for everyone to tap into that market. You have 400 million people, the middle class, with their aspiration, with the fact that they have the palate, to, the diversified palate to consume your products, which is very important and uh, the fact that we have a high disposable income. That is something which has created ripples and we are willing to open up to any country uh, in terms of when they want to send their products to the Indian market, to launch their products in the Indian market and give them the right platform in the Indian market. Obviously there are challenges with every opportunity, there are challenges and that's the whole idea. And the challenges have been the inward looking policies of the government, the government not wanting to allow companies to come and export to India, rather wanting them to come and uh, you know, invest in India. Now we keep on telling them that if you want to have these companies invest in India, you have to first let them open up the market in the Indian scenario, get them a, uh, a certain credible 
rate of success, and then they would be willing to invest in the Indian market. And we've seen that in the past, from a Ferrero investing $100 million, from a Monin planning to invest about $50 million. So many companies who've had successes in the past have later on invested in the Indian market. The high import tariff is something which everyone talks about, and that is going to remain a reality on ground. The tariffs will be there. And the geopolitical situation is going to be a challenge. Once again, the fact that there is a tariff war going on, and uh, India is part of that tariff war, whether it is with the US or China, that is going to remain in the Indian perspective. And the non-tariff barriers from the methyl bromide fumigation, which we've been fighting with the government to remove, because of the fact that that is used as a non-tariff barrier. There is no need because 80% of the world doesn't recognize methyl bromide. The cost of doing it is too expensive, and also it deteriorates the product quality. So in the long run, methyl bromide is not something that we are looking at, but the fact is that the government is using it as a non-tariff barrier, so that is something that we have to look at. So the, you know, I want to open up the session now. I spoke to Ambassador Melba Priya, and she told me there's no need for protocol, but I would still follow one. Uh, and I would request her uh, to talk about the fact that how Mexico has been able, it, you know, everyone loves Mexican food. Uh, I have never found a soul on the planet who would say that he doesn't love Mexican food. And, uh, but what happens to Mexican food in India, how it has evolved, what are the kind of efforts taken in by the embassy or the trade bodies like pro-Mexico uh, to make sure that the right audience is tapped into and you get the right audience to consume your product. Uh, thank you all for being here. Clearly, the regional players are, are more attractive to, to you than us, but thank you all for staying around. <clears throat> Let me talk to you a little bit about Mexico. When you talk about Mexico, you talk about the biggest exporter of mango, you talk about the biggest exporter of lime, of watermelon, of tomatoes, of pepper, you talk about uh, the biggest exporter of onion, the biggest exporter of frozen, ma why, why do I talk about that? Because we know when to harvest and we know how to preserve. You also talk about the biggest exporter of frozen mango, of frozen avocado paste, and of frozen berry. Again, why do I talk about that? It's because we know our cold chain. Um, Europeans have um, sort of said that the Mexican ready food market is about a $50 billion market. Uh, we are a, a very big exporter, the biggest exporter of food to the US. We are the fifth big largest exporter of dairy products. We are the fifth largest exporters of confectionery. So it doesn't matter which of the many um, areas of um, food you talk about, Mexico is there somewhere between the 5th and the 12th and the 1st and the 7th and the 4th. Now, the problem of India, or the problem of Mexico, actually, in India, is that nobody knows it. We are the biggest exporter of beer in the world and the second exporter of beer in India. But that's about it. And uh, so the efforts that we are making uh, to become a player in India are very large and very various. And I am going to talk about that uh, maybe a little later. So this is just an introduction to say, it's great to be number one, two, three, four, or 12th, but nobody knows it. So it doesn't matter what you are. Uh, Ambassador, you know, one of the things that we've seen is the fact that as far as the demand is concerned, we see a lot of your products into the Indian market, maybe not coming in directly from your country, but the fact is they are still available. Um, you know, how do you, you know, take that with the, you know, obviously that means the opportunity is there, so maybe a Mexican company is not able to capitalize on that opportunity. And that has been the case with a lot of products from a lot of countries where they are not directly being exported from that particular country. But trading hubs like Dubai, Singapore, Thailand um, come in as kind of willing to give you the right certificates to get the product into the Indian market. So when we see at the vegetable products, the exotic vegetables, almost 80% of the vegetables come in from Thailand. Now that's a strange thing because Thailand doesn't produce half of those vegetables. No. So... Um. We have 65% of every wrap that you have 
in India, that you eat wherever you eat, at the airport, in your coffee shop, wherever. And that comes from a very big Mexican company that is called Maseca, but it comes from uh, their mission food area. Every flaming hot Cheetos that you eat here comes from Mexico. Agave syrup, popsicle, bubble gum, and of course, chocolate and popcorn. Nobody remembers that when you say chocolate, you are actually using an Aztec word. Every time you say tomato, you are using an Aztec word. And every time you say avocado, you are using an Aztec word. So popcorns were available in Mexico in the 17th century. And I was walking around today and I was looking at Italian popcorn, French popcorn, and you know, great popcorn. Um, uh, but you know, initially they came from Mexico. Yes, uh, many of the Mexican companies are using their brands, uh, say in the US or in other places in the world, to, in Canada actually, to export their markets. And many Mexican brands, what they're doing is that they are investing here. Golden Harvest, who is the biggest um, baker in India, 65% of Golden Harvest was bought by Bimbo. Bimbo and all its affiliates in the world is the biggest uh, producer of bread in the world. So what we're doing is we're acquiring Indian companies uh, to do that. There, are, there is a lot to be done by Mexican companies to enter the Indian market. We were just discussing a, a, a while ago that India and Mexico are two countries that know one thing, the difference between hot and spicy. And that is, not many countries can do that. So we should um, benefit from that uh, capacity to enhance and entice the Indian palate because we understand that, that Indians like. And we have not been uh, too good at doing it. And, and therefore, there has to be a lot to be done for that. And, and produce in India the things that are, you know, we don't know masala. We call it mole, what you call curry. But it's exactly the same. It's a masala of uh, chile and, and, and spices. We call it differently, you call it differently, but at the, at the end of the day is something that is an acquired taste for you and for us because we were fed as kids like that. So um, the, the things that the companies are doing, as I said, to enter the Indian market is actually acquiring some of, of the Indian companies, but there is a lot to be done in uh, introducing not the Mexican food, not the Mexican taste, but actually the Mexican products. I couldn't agree with you on the spice bit that, uh, you know, whenever we talk to a European, he says Indian food is spicy. And I tell him it's flavorful. So the difference between spicy and flavorful gets lost into that translation. And, uh, you know, when Indians go over there, uh, they put everything from a Tabasco to a hot sauce on everything. And, uh, you know, in fact, uh, Turkey is the same. So, you know, to counsel from, uh, Consul Ali from Turkey, I want to you know, see that Turkey has been quite progressive in terms of promoting their brands and brand Turkey has become a very predominant name, especially in the confectionery segment, along with other categories of products. Um, you know, you've been working towards bringing more and more products into the Indian subcontinent and uh, you know, we've seen certain promotions which you have done. And what have been the successes of the past where you've worked towards getting a certain achievable goal and that goal has been achieved over a stipulated period of time? Uh, thanks a lot, uh, first of all, for today's kind invitation. As you know, Turkey and India are among the largest and fastest growing economies in the world. Yet, when we look at the bilateral trade figures, we see that we are far behind the, the potential. That's why we are trying to uh, be more active in the Indian market, try to be uh, more aggressive, to have a better share in the Indian market. And of course, we have seen some uh, positive developments, for example, over the last year. Our bilateral trade volume has increased 
to eight billion dollars, and the goal is to reach ten billion dollars in the shortest time possible. It is also um, good to see that I'm pleased to see that more and more visitors from India are uh, going to Turkey, not only for tourism but also doing for for doing business. And we have seen an 80% increase in the number of visitors just last year. So through these bilateral contacts and mutual visits, I'm sure we will have better opportunities to increase uh, our business ties as well. Uh, of course, Turkey has a robust agriculture and uh, food industry, and Turkey is one of the world's largest agricultural, one of the largest agricultural producer. Uh, likewise, we all know that agriculture and uh, food industry significantly contributes to the growth of India. And it goes without saying that India, with its uh, population, growth and other uh, potential, offers huge opportunities as one of the uh, biggest consumer markets in the world for the food industry. I firmly believe that um, from the Turkish perspective, uh, there are many opportunities ahead of us. Uh, of course, there are challenges, but uh, there are challenges to be overcome. And I'm sure uh, we will seize the opportunities before us in cooperation with our Indian colleagues and friends. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, I wanted to, obviously, you know, tourism plays such an important role between any country's relationship. And obviously, food also sees no boundary. Uh, the taste familiarity, the kind of food that you get over there makes a huge difference. So whenever I am in Turkey, I'm sure to go to eat, um, uh, you know, the Iskandar kebab, or now you have uh, one of the best, I shouldn't say the best, but yes, one of the best guys who is doing a phenomenal job with meat, uh, Nusrat. I was there recently at his restaurant, and he is phenomenal in terms of what uh, he's transforming, and I would love to have his restaurant in India uh, to be serving to the Indian audience because I believe that there is great potential for Turkish food in India. We, we don't see, and food, as I said, opens up a lot of, you know, how Mexican food has entered into our lives is something which is, uh, you know, very familiar, and we are able to correlate with the rice, with the beans, with the tortilla, and that makes it very easy for us. On the other side, you know, uh, I would ask Council Damien from Poland in terms of the fact that, uh, you know, when I visit your country, I find that uh, there are many products which are unique to the European Union, and you guys are doing a great job in producing those products from dairy to pork. Uh, the only place in the world where I found that shrimp has been smoked, so I've never had smoked shrimp in my life, but Poland was a place where I found smoked shrimp, and it was fantastic. So, you know, how are, you know, the Polish embassy making efforts to enter the Indian market, especially into the dairy segment and the fruits. Uh, apples is, I think uh, every Polish person takes pride in his apples uh, and they're very sentimental about it. So, so how do you do that and what are the efforts uh, or what are the measures or what are the activities that you've entailed upon? Uh, thank you, Amit, for this very kind introduction to the to, to Polish uh, food industry and our uh, presence here in India, but um, I, I wanted to start with the, uh, some basics about the uh, Polish agriculture, something which is uh, quite unique for the European Union uh, member states. Um, uh, Polish farms are relatively small. We have about 1.5 million farms that are smaller than uh, 10 hectares. And from the point of view of efficiency, uh, that seems to be a liability. But at the same time, we are one of the largest food exporters among the EU member states. And probably we have the largest surplus in trade with uh, agricultural products. Last year, it was uh, 12 billion euros, 30 billion was export and 18 billion import of the foods. So why, why was that? I mean, the, f the first and most important reason is that most of our export goes to the EU member states. Those very sophisticated customers in Germany, France, UK, Italy, who um, value a wider set of standards rather than just food safety. I mean, food safety is a basic, but 
what these customers uh, valued the most is uh, some kind of regional approach, some family basic farming, and, and the, the, the highest quality of, of the foods. So uh, having said that, 75% of our export goes to these countries. And when it comes to Asian countries, it's, uh, it, it requires a very different approach. So the first question that we have here from the importers uh, in India or such markets like in China, so it's like what, what, what scale we can provide um, at uh, particular I don't know, apples or, or, or poultry uh, or, or other products, I'll just name a few that we have already certificates for India. Uh, so the problem is that these uh, producers in Poland are rather small and uh, the uh, market access to India is difficult. It costs quite a lot. So what, what our embassy in New Delhi does, what our government does, is to uh, try to merge those, those producers at least uh, to present them under common brand. Like, for example, you mentioned the Polish apples. That's a, that's a very good example. We were doing extremely well in such markets as like Russia, for example, or Ukraine, and suddenly we, the, there was an embargo uh, from the Russian side. So we have to really reorientate our uh, uh, export policies when it comes to promotion of apples. And we put a lot of efforts for uh, Indian market, for example. So that's, uh, we already have an access to, to this market. Uh, and, and we are now talking to the importers uh, from various, uh, various uh, industries here and uh, on Apple's industries. And, and we are having already some successes in, 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 in the entering of the, of the Polish apples. So uh, the biggest challenge for us is just to show our producers that they have to act together on this market because this is too big to, to, to play just uh, a lonely uh, fight on, on, for the, for the uh, market share. In fact, sometimes, as um, in one of my earlier sessions, I was talking of the fact that importers take that stride of going to a certain country, looking for a particular product, understanding the value that that country offers, and bringing that product in India. So you would be surprised to find a lot of Polish mozzarella cheese coming into India uh, without any effort from the company's side. The companies are not willing to... The only thing that they are offering to the importer is the price. So they're giving a very great value propositional price, and the importers are bringing in. Soon you'll find a lot of QSR format players like McDonald's, KFC, Pizza Hut. Uh, companies are already pitching Polish mozzarella to them, so if five years ago somebody would have told me that you'll be finding Polish mozzarella in India, I would have been shocked, but today that shock and that awe is gone, that's not there anymore. But from Poland, actually I want to talk to Marika from the delegation of European Union. Now, you kind of head the umbrella organization, uh, which is looking at all, the ki all kinds of food products coming into the country. We spoke earlier about the fact that how cured meats are not being allowed into the country, how you guys are fighting in terms of uh, the duty tariffs on vines and wanting a reduction, and that has been going on for a long time. Now, you know, we find that delegation of European Union has been very proactive in the Indian market, you guys have been uh, working together with many state uh, partners. But on ground, we find still uh, countries taking that leap of doing their own promotions. We don't find the umbrella doing a larger promotion, which it can, rather than individual countries are taking, uh, there is an Italian food festival and there is, so we don't find that. So are there certain measures or online uh, social platforms that you use to create awareness about European Union products uh, in totality? Okay, thank you. Thanks, first of all, for inviting us here. Um, I mean, the EU, just to, to, uh, to clarify, so the EU, indeed, we represent all 28 EU member states. So uh, the way it works is that at EU level, we try to create better market conditions. So to try to get more market access and uh, that goes from uh, trying to reduce duties to, to other non-market access barriers. Whereas then at the member state level, they do the promotion part. So uh, what we do at our level is we try to engage with the Indian government and we have been very proactive there to, to create, let's say, a dialogue to, uh, to improve the conditions for our, 
our exporters to enter the Indian market. And uh, how we do that is uh, we have like, uh, of course, bilateral meetings, but we have created also dialogues both on the, on the animal side and on the, um, on the plant product side. And um, it is starting to, to, to bear some fruit. We are seeing some more market, uh, market openings for European products, but it is slow, it's not easy. And uh, just to echo what my uh, Turkish colleague said uh, here, it's uh, India's such a huge market, but we're still very much underperforming. If you think like the EU is the biggest uh, producer exporter in the world of agricultural products, ranging from dairy to meat to alcoholic beverages. I mean, there's a huge variety of products and uh, we are still exporting less than 1 billion to the, to the Indian market, whereas India exports about 4 billion to, to Europe. So there's a huge uh, deficit there still. So we have a lot of potential here. And uh, we are, of course, trying to work on that to, to create better conditions. And uh, let's hope that we will uh, get there eventually. And uh, indeed, uh, looking forward to more cooperation with uh, FIFI in this field to create better, better conditions for all of us. Thanks. Thank you, Marika. Uh, you know, absolutely, whenever I speak to any European delegation uh, member state and we talk of this disparity between the imports and the exports, now that is also because we find, uh, I'm telling you an importer's perspective now, the fact that when we go to these companies and tell them that we want to import your products into the country, their unwillingness to support us in terms of the labeling, in terms of getting a fully compliant product, sometimes hinders the business. Also the fact that they find exporting to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in the region, they find it more easy. So when you talk to, I'll give you an example for Canada. If you talk to a Canadian company, he says, US is my biggest buyer and I'm happy with it. Uh, Mexican also has a similar fashion that they will say, I, I'm selling to US, I don't care. So sometimes this becomes a challenge for us because I want the product. I am willing to invest in your brand. I'm willing to invest, but I need some bit of support. So that is some challenge which has been there. So I believe that the European Union and its member states and anywhere from the world, you have to be more aggressive when you want to come into the Indian market more proactive. We recently did a seminar with the, the European Union delegation in, in Delhi, where we invited the top bosses of all the uh, ministries from Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Health, Ministry of Consumer Affairs. And we invited all of them to come together with the diplomatic missions and the importers together. This is the first time it has happened in the history because they never wanted to sit with the diplomats because they gave us uh, a very conducive, formal answer to a diplomat, whereas to an importer, they give the exact opposite, that this is not possible. To a diplomat, they would say, no, let me see what we can do and what we cannot do. So that becomes a challenge, and that we need to have more and more interactions with the government to let them open up more and more doors. And in India, if you don't push the doors, they're not gonna open. So you need to push it hard to open, get these doors open. Uh, Jürgen from the, the Belgium consulate in Mumbai, you know, we met last year and we spoke about the fact that there is great potential for Belgium products and brand Belgium already is uh, considered premium, you know, considered top, top niche. But we only see Belgium pork, Belgium uh, chocolates, and Belgian beer. And then story ends over there. The Belgian fries are there, but uh, we, we get confused between American fries and Belgian fries and all these other fries. So that is something that is... But, you know, obviously we see that you guys have done a great effort and, uh, you know, your uh, FIT has been quite proactive in terms of communicating with the importers. I was there at ISM recently and I uh, met your colleague and she was trying to get each and every importer to each and every booth uh, at the ISM to allow them to meet and get the confectionery business grow at a much faster pace. But what are the other activities that you're, you're planning to do maybe this year? Do you have a calendar? Do you make an annual calendar in terms of the promotions that you intend to take? Yes, uh, thank you, Amit, also for in, uh, inviting us to the panel. Uh, I think I represent the smallest country here on the, on, on the podium. Um, but, um, and I'm, I'm mentioning this because um, we, if, if we look at our food industry back in Belgium, it's uh, mainly an SME uh, industry, small, medium-sized companies who are often very experienced in uh, exporting, they have to, 
because the smaller your country is, the more abroad there is for you, and the more experienced you need to be in export to be able to survive. But what we see is that, uh, indeed, for India, you have mentioned the obstacles on, on the uh, Indian market and the difficulties that you also, as an importer, uh, experience on a daily basis. I think that uh, until two, maybe three years ago, what we saw is that most companies just said, OK, India, it's just too complicated for, for us. We're not going to go there. We recognize it's an important market. We recognize there's potential, but we have other things, uh, we have other priorities. We see this changing. And I must say, it's at an accelerating, uh, changing uh, level where we really see year by year more companies coming to the Indian market. And together with the importer, um, um, really taking a good look at how they can approach the Indian market. You mentioned the Belgian pork, the Belgian beer, the Belgian chocolates. There's another example, the Belgian apples. Apple. There's actually a variety of uh, Belgian apples, the Jolly Red, that has been uh, developed uh, specifically to acquire the more uh, sweeter uh, or ap the appetite of the Indian consumer towards a more sweeter uh, taste. And I'm giving this example because it's, I think it's a good example of what we will see more in the years to come. We will see more exporters coming to the Indian market who are motivated to, first of all, to, to do the uh, effort to get to know the market and then sit together with their importer, with distributors, to really uh, um, develop a product or to uh, change their product or packaging or tastes or whatever to the Indian market. And uh, um, we, it, it has started, and I think we will see this more. Maybe then to, to come to your uh, second point that you mentioned, which actions uh, do you take on the Indian market? We are a small country. We do not have uh, the budgets that some other countries may have for large uh, marketing campaigns. However, we tend to focus on B2B activities. You have mentioned um, that we were present at Gulf Food. Uh, we were, this year we were at ISM in uh, Cologne also, where we do very targeted campaigns towards bringing Indian uh, importers, distributors, retailers together with our exporters. And um, we have a customs attaché based in our uh, embassy in Delhi, also to help both the Indian importer and the Belgian exporter when they have specific questions regarding regulations. So we tend to do more below the radar uh, activities. And I must say that um, they are paying off, but this is a long-term uh, work also. And I don't think I have to tell you that. Uh. And I absolutely agree that it is going to be a long-term story and investments in India are not going to be cheap. But yes, if you have consistency in your efforts, that pays off. We've seen in the past that whenever countries or companies have been persistent in terms of promoting their products into the country, it has paid off in the long run. One country which has worked very closely, we've worked very closely as an association, uh, has been Canada. And uh, Nitin is here from the Canadian High Commission. And, you know, he has, uh, we talk about his connections in the Indian government, and we always uh, you know, talk about the fact that he's one of those people in the diplomatic circle who has great connections with all the Indian ministries. And that is something which is very much required also to get resolutions of all the issues that get up. Because in India, the challenge is the importer doesn't come up with their issues until the shipment gets stuck. He doesn't work on preliminary uh, kind of evaluation of the product, but rather he would go with the import and then decide when the shipment gets stuck, let's go to the embassy, knock their doors and tell them that there's something you need to do. If you don't do it, you're not supporting your country. So Nitin, uh, you know, I know we've worked on various promotional activities, but yes, uh, you know, we find that uh, also when we were discussing earlier that the fact that when the officer changes, you know, the, the councillor, minister, councillor, agriculture changes or the ambassador changes, 
we see a different embassy altogether. And that's pretty strange. The policy should be one way. I, I have never understood the fact that how can you change your policy? Today you are aggressive. All of a sudden a new ambassador comes in and they say, okay, now let's go to Agra and Jodhpur and Udaipur and I don't care what's happening in India. So that is not something that should happen. So Nitin, please, uh, if you can elaborate. Thanks, Amit. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I have to be careful of my job, so I won't speak to that last point. But uh, I do appreciate some of the comments you made earlier about the challenges in working with India. And I think two challenges I can highlight. In addition, that Canada faces is the distance um, in terms of shipping some of the products here. We do have a, a fairly long shipment window. It takes about 36 to 45 days to get a Canadian product to this market. And the other challenge we've seen is one of price. And that tends to be because uh, although Canada relies quite heavily on exports, um, we export almost 50, more than 50% in almost every commodity category and food product because uh, of the small, relatively small population size we have um, in Canada. Um, the products tend to be a higher price, higher quality. And so what, one of the opportunities that we've been telling our Canadian exporters for food products in India is uh, to work in specific product segments where there has been some differentiation for price. Um, it, India is a price sensitive market, but at the same time, being such a large market, there is uh, a customer at every price point. And so uh, most of our Canadian exporters tend to focus on the higher um, end of that segment. And, and just to echo some of the comments Amit and others have made earlier about uh, the importance of uh, working in this market and being persistent, uh, one common mantra we give all our Canadian companies is the three P's that we call to working in India, which is uh, patience, perseverance, and deep pockets to do the marketing that's required in a country of this size. Um, we often tell people, don't think of India as one country, think of it as many different states, because you're going to have a different segmentation for your product and appreciation um, in different parts of the country and you should take advantage of that and maybe focus your promotional efforts in a certain part of the country. Um, some of the things uh, I, I will say too that I would encourage people work uh, to see their products succeed is to work with a trusted partner like FIFI and, and some of the other people here. Um, you know, and that's some of the work we do at the High Commission of Canada. We, ha we are present in this country in eight different cities through our various consul offices and trade offices and we provide services to uh, Canadian companies that are looking to expand their presence um, in this market. I mentioned patience um, and perseverance. One of the successes I can highlight from a Canadian perspective has been the recent market access success we had for pork products into, into India. Um, and I'll tell you from a regulatory perspective, I work for Canada's regulator, that took us over 14 years to achieve. And, and through engagements with the Indian government, as well as through prominent industry associations such as FIFI and, and Mr. Banga here, it was very helpful on that regard. So I, just to highlight that you really do have to work with, with key partners and, and people that can, can get you the success you need. Um, yeah. Thank you, Nitin. And uh, you know, the fact that every trade body and high commission or embassy or a consulate should work with the right associations, whether it is us, but there are different uh, chambers which are available because we have on-ground information on how things work in India, what is the right language which is required to get your product processed in India, and sometimes when the push comes from us, it makes it easier for the officer to go ahead and sign that document because that final document is the key to get the product into the country. And he's very reluctant otherwise to do that signing because he believes that he's helping a Canadian or an American or a Polish or a Mexican. But the fact is he's helping Indian businesses because when international foods come to India, they create a benchmark. And that benchmark is often carried over by Indian companies, whether it is in terms of joint venture, whether it is in terms of local production. And that opens up a great plethora of products and markets for us. And we need to have those products into the uh, system. Now, you know, I want to go to uh, Margot uh, with, you know, from the French consulate and the fact that we find successes of many products like Bon Mama, Monen, which have been there in the market for the long time and now setting a plant in India. But there are also the perils that I was speaking to Francois and she was saying that uh, when I go to one of the gourmet stores in India and only see four or five varieties of 
cheese uh, or dairy from France, whereas we have more than 2,000. The fact that why French cheese or French dairy products have not been able to penetrate in this similar fashion, is it something which is, uh, you know, you're not doing the right marketing, the companies are not able to understand the Indian market? Obviously, the challenges are quite similar for all of you, whether it is tariff or non-tariff barriers. I don't believe that the challenges are pertaining to one single country or one single continent. It pertains to all of you. So, you know, what do you think are the main challenges that you have faced in the country? So, good evening, everyone. So, Business Runs of the French Trade Commission. So, we trade and investment agency. So, we are supporting the French economy. So basically, we want to uh, increase uh, the development of the French brand and French company in India, and more specifically in dairy products, in cheese, and also in meat products. So we are working on and also we are promoting uh, India, and we want to create a good partnership with India, between India and French uh, company and also to, to identify the good opportunity for, for French cheese in India. But we have to, uh, to lead the French company in, and to help them to understand the Indian market. Thank you, Margot. And last but not the least, uh, Guy from UKTI. Now, I met him about, what, last year in UK? Yeah, yeah in the UK. And the first thing I asked him was that, you know, what do you think, what are you going to do in India? Because we find, uh, very frankly, certain times uh, they are not happy coming to India. Uh, and I wanted to know whether he's happy or not. And he was excited uh, to come to India. So, and then uh, the fact that we have, we, in the morning session which we had with uh, UKIBC, we discussed the fact that how... Uh, British products have affiliation with India. We already have a lot of British products coming into India. A uh, lot of British products, so sometimes they come up and tell to us that, can you sell our curries into India? And I was like, uh, the curries are coming from our side. So, you know, it's very good. It's going to be very difficult for me to sell a chicken curry or a chicken tikka masala in India coming in from UK. But yes, a uh, lot of products which are great affiliation with India, uh, but uh, we find obviously there are challenges, but large companies are coming into India. They're doing a lot of investment into the Indian market. And the smaller companies, the SMEs, uh, always face that bigger challenge of launching. But UKTI and UKBIC now, which is going to be the partner arm of uh, UKTI to promote or, uh, I don't know, maybe handle the entire exports uh, promotion market in the Indian scenario. So what are the kind of uh, efforts that you believe are required to enter an Indian market? Sure. Um, so, first off, I am very much enjoying India. I had been on holiday here a lot of times and always wanted to work and live in India. Um, I love the country, as do many of my fellow country people, because um, we are so open. We're perhaps one of the only European countries that does really like spice. I would say, hand on heart, very happily, at a um, British... Uh, food and drink event, that my national dish was curry. Um, and um, that's because we are very open to overseas influences. And we really understand the, uh, the value of taking on board um, influences from around the world. Um, so that makes us understand the value of adding value to food um, and responding to what our customers want. Because we're so, um, because we, we've adopted so many cuisines, and we have particular affinity with the Indian market. And we're very happy that you have adopted whiskey as your national drink. Um, in 2011, we were selling um, 20 million pounds of whiskey a year to India. Uh, we're now selling 120 million pounds of whiskey to India. Um, and um, the reason, I guess, for this is because um, we have very high standards. We are blessed to be next to the Atlantic Ocean, and we are washed with um, clean rain several times a day, as many of you who know the UK will, will attest to. Um, and, um, but, we, but we're also looking to expand. Uh, that also helps us to um, uh, have a very good dairy industry. And actually, we're having a lot of success. We're talking about cheese just then. A lot of success in the uh, British cheese industry, and you can find British cheese um, across India. Um, because I think we like to adapt to the market and um, we want to find um, 
we want to find um, new markets for our products. Um, I guess in terms of what is, what is the, the, uh, the interest in the Indian market, I think we have a huge affinity for India. Uh, people want to do business here. They like coming to India. Companies like Indians and like to build relationships with many of you um, and want to see their product selling here and people enjoying it. And I think that's one of the major things is the kind of people-to-people -people relationships we have. Um, that makes doing business here a, a real pleasure. Um, so we hope to continue to do that. Of course it's challenging. It's not the easiest market at all, and people have to come here um, being quite realistic. I think what Nitin said about the three Ps is a, is a good mantra that perhaps the Brits should adopt too. But as long as you've researched the three Ps, um, we know there's demand here, and uh, we, we want to provide it. Thank you. Yes, Ambassador, please. Um, let me put a, 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 um, also a positive note on this. Uh, we all know that the challenges of coming into the Indian market are very big, but we have also seen the change in the Indian market. Uh, the last four years, we have seen you, retailers, reach out to our uh, producers, because none of us are producers. We produce wealth for you and wealth for the people back home. We want you to sell our products because that means that our people will have more jobs and your people will um, have better taste or different tastes. So I, I, I am very surprised at the openness of the Indian palate. Uh, it wasn't like that 10 years ago. Uh, Indians like Indian food. And if you are from South India, you like South Indian food. And if you are from North India, you like North Indian food. Maybe for breakfast you would have a tali or something like that, but that's about it. But now, more and more Indian people are traveling, more and more Indian people are sort of uh, opening to different tastes, and it has become very exciting to work in India. Uh, also our companies, and I speak for Mexico, but surely most of us in the panel would uh, agree with that. Also, our companies are sort of <coughs> less uh, worried about entering the Indian market. So it's very exciting to work here. Uh, yes, the three Ps are there, and I could think about other Ps um, that, that would add to that. But we are here because we want to be here, and we are here because we're very excited to be here. One supermarket does not look that, like the other, uh, smaller chains are out there and proposing things to their local market. It is not the same to be from Hyderabad, to be from Delhi, or to be from Mumbai. And more and more restaurants are coming up with different options for, for Indian palate. And that is very exciting for producers from our country and, of course, for us that represent the capacity of them to, to enter a market like India. Absolutely well said. I'm going to put a, a question to all of you. Now, the question is, it's actually not that difficult, but one product from each of your countries which you believe would be a great success in the Indian context. Any one product, one category or one product which you believe will be uh, highly successful if you know, launched in the right manner. We'll start with Guy, actually. Guy. Um, one thing that I think would work really well here is a lot of people are trying to reduce sugar in their diet. Um, we make a wide range of cordials, which do have sugar, but a lot less sugar than fizzy drinks. So you still get that sweet taste, but you could get something much fresher and better for you. Um, and Britain produces a huge range of delicious cordials from our um, very good fruit production. So I'd say cordials. Okay. Nathan. Uh, from Canada. The only answer to that question is canola oil. Um, <laughs> India's largest food import, actually large, second largest import of all, second only to petroleum, is edible oil. And India also happens to be the world's capital country of cardiovascular disease. And there's a linkage there because a lot of the oil that's being consumed in India, a lot of the food that's fried in India is being fried or cooked in an oil that may not, may not be the, the healthiest option for Indian population. 
Canada is also the largest producer of canola oil, which is regarded as one of the healthiest oil, um, edible oil options in the world. And we've seen a lot of success in markets like the US, Japan, China, Korea, uh, where they've switched over to using canola oil uh, almost exclusively over preferred over palm oil and, and derivatives. Um, and I'll just point out one study that uh, Singapore, the Singapore government did actually on the benefits of canola oil where they subsidized um, the Horeca sector's use of palm oil by uh, 50%. They were uh, basically allowing the Horeca sector to use half canola oil and subsidizing the cost. And they found a almost tenfold decrease in health costs associated with the expenses for that substitute. So um, that's, uh, that's Canada's perspective. So we import about $16 billion of palm oil into the country. If tomorrow we would have to subsidize canola oil, that would be great news for all of us. Uh, and it would be a healthy nation. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But uh, Marika, I know uh, it's a large, you, you represent so many countries. But yes, what would be that one product that you believe uh, and you cannot be uh, partial towards any of the European uh, you know, states which are sitting over here, so. Indeed, this is a challenge, obviously. I cannot uh, prefer one to the other since I represent 28 EU member states here. So I have to, exactly, I'm not going to say 28 products. <laughs> Maybe I take just from a purely personal perspective, what I would love to see more here is European wines and champagne and sparkling wines and cheese. So I think there's she's, uh, she's picked up all the categories. She's got the wine, she's got the alcohol, she's got the dairy, <laughs> so she's keeping everyone happy. So, yeah. <laughs> Council Ali, please. Thanks a lot. Difficult to answer, actually, as a big uh, agricultural uh, producer. Um, but I think olive oil should be uh, one in the list, as, uh, as we are also a leading manufacturer of olive oil in the Mediterranean. It's also good for health and uh, tasty, and I'm sure it's, uh, it's becoming more popular in India as well. Thank you, Council. Ambassador. Uh, besides those things that we already export and that we have been very good at exporting, I would actually say um, mango chile. Mango chile? Yes, uh, or chile mango, or however you want to, pay, to, to put it together. Uh, India is the biggest consumer of uh, mango in the world. Uh, also the biggest producer, but not so the biggest exporter, that is Mexico. Uh, we both enjoy Chile, and in our part of the world, you eat mango with Chile. So if I would completely think out of the box and not talk about tortilla and tequila and beer and all of that, um, I would say mango Chile. She smartly mentioned all the names of all the products that she believe have potential in the Indian market. but. <laughs> Poland, yes. So I think that we are best in meat producing. So I will not brand it here, and we are in India. So, uh, so the second uh, most important uh, product, I think, is milk and dairy products. And I think that we are very good in in in, in cheese and and all the so well broadly broadly understood dairy products. Um, and there is also one more uh, thing that uh, Poland is good at is uh, the. Um, a food processing industry, and uh, that's a very, I mean, I think that's pro probably a huge potential for cooperation with India. Uh, we have totally transformed our industry, uh, agricultural industry, in the past 15 years, and it uh, resulted in, in, in also in developing our indigenous industry in food processing. So, so I think that's also a, a, a little bit different approach, but I, uh, that would work with India really, really good. Thank you, Council Damien. Jürgen. Yes, Belgium. So, what other answer than Belgian chocolate? See, Shoma is recording, yeah. so whatever you say is going to go yes. on record. So, just make sure that you say the right thing. Yes, but I, th I think it, it is the answer because, uh, but what we will see is we, see, we will see Belgian chocolates coming to India that where the taste has been uh, adapted to the Indian palate. That's taste-wise, but also logistics-wise. There's a lot of research going on in, 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 in Belgium about uh, the ability to keep uh, chocolates uh, good and, and edible also at higher temperatures. And uh, I, will, I think we will see this coming to the market in the next uh, yeah, three, three years.
the India is a country where we put our chocolates in the refrigerator and we want it chilled. So I have never understood the fact that it's supposed to be at 15 degrees. But none of the facilities that we have able to, you know, cater to that market. So we keep it either at 4 degrees, which is crazy, or we keep it at 32, which is again another level of crazy. So that's there. But Margot, please, anything from the French side that you believe absolutely makes sense to the Indian market? To bring uh, fine cheese. Fine cheese. Yeah. So dairy goods is going to take over the whole thing. So, okay, now we have, uh, you know, obviously you have the ambassadors and councils of uh, the embassies over here. So we are giving off a Schenigan visa for five years, multiple entry. <laughs> okay. And the Mexican visa is there. So guys, whoever is going to ask me a good question. <laughs> the good thing is that if you have a Schengen visa, you don't need a Mexican oh, okay. visa. <laughs> So anyone, uh, I'll open up for questions. Anyone has a question? Yeah, one question. Okay, we only have time for one question. Anyone? Okay, can we have the mic? Oh, okay. Anish has a question as well. So we'll take two questions. Anish, you want? You, yeah, no, no, that's okay. You can, you can ask your question, please. So I'm actually going to throw this around, Amit. And I'm partly biased because I have a Canadian company and I have a Dutch company and I have a Belgian company, so, so I have three representatives over there. But part of the problem that we have over here is not them and not the companies from the countries that they represent, but you guys. So when I hear about cheese, I will find a Comte once in a year and then I won't see it again for another 12 months. I'll see Stilton once and then I won't see it for 12 months after that. That's the problem. That's why the market's not growing because I'm not finding it on the shelf once I find it once. So then I'm flying to Dubai and I'm picking up my, my Stilton over there. So the change has to be from your side as well as theirs. Absolutely agree on the consistency level that uh, if you make a new consumer and the next time the consumer visits the store and the product is not available, he moves away from that category and he would look for an alternate. But uh, that challenge is there because of the fact a lot of times we are uh, and the companies are also not evolved enough to handle products. We do not know how the retail responds. You are one of those customers who loves the product. But the fact is, there are a lot of times when we bring in a product, uh, a lot of customers, they do not understand the value proposition, the price, the margins, the logistics. It is absolutely crazy buying a one euro product from Europe and selling it at five euros. And then uh, everyone sitting in the room believing that the importer is making the money. The fact is that, you know, we blame the retailers. One is sitting next to you. Uh, uh, they blame us. And with this, this uh, tug of war is going on with everyone because everyone is making the margin which is their aspiration and they believe that is the right aspiration. But yeah, that challenge is there and we, all of us, are working towards this challenge to be overcome in fact of bringing more consistently better value product at the right price and that is what all the negotiations and the discussions are all about so thank you so much and uh, you know uh, okay i have that one question please sorry hi my name is raju uh, i'd like to know you all are very keen to promote chocolate and confectionery business in india would like to know how the embassies are supporting it in terms of introduction, the products, making visibility. So how is the support coming in from the embassies? We support the Mexican exporter. We do not support the, Mex the Indian importer. So if we get the right uh, match, then we marry. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a privilege. Uh, I would request everyone for a group photo and then thank you so much.